shifting that status quo is just so daunting for people. And I think you can create like a funnel effect of content to really just like introduce people at a very top, a higher, you know, top general level, bring them down into like some of the more technical uh, language to kind of reinforce the arguments that they need to make. Um, and then you get them organized at a local level. If you can get just even just starting with a couple, like two, three, four, five people who are invested in the issue to just kind of start to coalesce language around this and to really like not focus on otherizing the NIMBYs at a local level. It's not about like attacking the people who, you know, want to maintain the status quo. Like we're saying, it's really about introducing solutions and potential and like just different styles of development that can really heal our towns. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Nathan Alabach. Uh, you may know Nathan <laughs> from TikTok and Twitter. Uh, he has been producing some amazing content recently, uh, diving into walkability and talking about third places and all things urbanism. And it's so exciting to see a fresh new face and voice coming into this space. Uh, and especially since he comes from a marketing background and, and really has just presented it brilliantly, I think you're gonna enjoy this conversation. I know you're gonna enjoy this conversation, so let's get right to it with Nathan. Nathan, thank you so much. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. It's my pleasure, John. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Nathan, I'd love to have my guests just uh, give a quick introduction uh, of themselves. So, who is Nathan? Yeah, so I, I guess I'll try to do this under three minutes because I have a weird background and and how I kind of came into the urbanism or placemaking or whatever you want to call it space online. But I'm a, I'm a marketer first. So I've been working in marketing for the past nine years for a small family agency. I kind of came into the internet culture world through running the um, the brand account Stakem on Twitter, and that gained some notoriety and some uh, national media headlines from 2017 to 2021. So I kind of gained like a bit of a like a Twitter following predominantly through that. And uh, I just kind of did like a lot of freelance writing and other engagement um, just through per my personal accounts from during that time and got into, you know, writing about conspiracy theories and culture wars and, and various sort of political and politically adjacent uh, subjects. And about a year and a half or almost two years ago, I suppose, I kind of came into a lot of like online housing discourse. Like I think my entryway was into the Yimbies on Twitter. I just I followed some accounts that had started to kind of talk about some of these issues around zoning and parking. And eventually, I'm not exactly sure how because my memory is terrible, but somehow that led me into the YouTube world. I'm presumably through the the almighty algorithm. And that brought me to some of the, the larger channels like Not Just Bikes. And that kind of funneled me through Strong Towns. And I, I don't remember which came first, uh, to be perfectly honest, but I started down this this kind of rabbit trail of just kind of uh, learning the language um, behind a lot of issues that intuitively I had uh, at least had a surface level understanding of kind of growing up, um, particularly around like infrastructure and car dependency. So that was my, my kind of gateway into developing content. And then in September of this past year, so 2022, or I guess it was maybe late August, I'd started producing uh, some short form videos on TikTok just about uh, car dependency and suburban sprawl and sort of what some of the um, potential near term solutions people can uh, contribute to uh, solving in, in these relative areas. So had some videos do relatively well. And all of a sudden, people were I guess, considering me a, a content creator in the space, I mean, I, 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 I don't have a, a formal background. I'm not an urban planner uh, or anything of that nature. I have a liberal studies degree and uh, I'm a hardcore hobbyist when it comes to the subjects I'm interested in. So this is one that I, I deep dived and now I'm talking to you. So, yeah, well, there you go. Well, I, I'm, I'm a health pr promotion professional and public health guy that uh, turned, you know, content creator myself. So there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, he, he, this, in fact, is your, your TikTok landing page. And if we scroll down here, yeah, I mean, we go back in time and we can see sort of a transition here. There's an inflection point that's rather easy to see. 
uh, going away from the, the, the TikTok videos with the kitty cats. And then, yeah, you're, you're right. They're right around in that uh, July, August uh, time frame. You start talking about, you know, walkability and some other interesting things. And I guess it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear that sort of origin story of, yeah, you know, kind of out on YouTube, went into the uh, the urbanism uh, hole and uh, you know discovered Jason Slaughter and not just bikes and then he did a wonderful series of profiling uh, strong towns and the strong towns movement and and his famous strode you know video uh, there so it it, it it you're not the first person that I've you know talked to who's been like yeah you know we went down this rabbit hole and and then suddenly got inspired but what is amazing about your content is uh, the groove that you got in and are in in terms of producing this. And like you said, you you had a few, you know, kind of take off. You know, we've got some, you know, 26,000, 46,000 views here. But then you get to the top and boom, 1.4 million views talking about third places how how extraordinary has this been? This is like a wild toads ride here. <laughs> it, it's been it's been tremendous for me because I like I said I kind of I've taken interest to various uh, cultural and political politically charged topics over the years that I've written about, like for both personal blogs and and through other um, media outlets. So like I've been spending some portion of my personal life on my mostly my Twitter account um, writing and and sharing thoughts about like various subjects. But like I said, the past few years, so much of my, uh, I guess you'd say my online identity has circled around my marketing work. That's just like what people have known me for, for better or worse. And it just became one of these things that, you know, I, I'm obviously grateful for the work and grateful for the, for the opportunity. It, it led to so many incredible things that have happened to me in that, that time span. But also like, I'm not a huge fan of marketing. And that's part of what made my work, I think, stand out in that space initially years ago is like I was very uh, sort of like an anti-marketer marketer, you know, Mm -hmm. like or anti-marketing marketer. Like I would speak to a lot of the issues that I found um, at like a meta level while doing marketing. And so like now, you know, years later, I kind of just got to the point where I'm like, man, I have this big following. These people know me from the space, but I don't really like to spend my free time thinking about or posting about or talking about marketing stuff. So like I, I would always kind of, you know, just freely speak about whatever the issue was I was interested in at that time. So when I came across this content and started producing around it, it was a really cool thing to, to start to kind of explore another aspect of my interests and kind of get more of myself out there because I never really, especially with video. I mean, we, you and I were talking before the show just about, you know, the, the importance of video on platforms like YouTube. And I had never really dived into that medium at all. And I wasn't sure how it was going to come across or how it was going to succeed. Because, you know, like temperamentally, people have different tastes and like no matter who you are, like you're not going to be for everybody. And I, and I wasn't sure if I even wanted to put this part of myself out there because for years on Twitter, like I, I've gotten pretty deep in some discourses that have, have uh, led to some unsavory interactions that, you know, I, I've, I've, I've had some issues where people have like doxed me and attempted to swap me, um, over my work and marketing. So like the thought of putting my face in front of people was always a weird subject, but I'm, I'm really glad that I did. And like, to your point, like, yeah, the videos have progressively continued to climb slowly and resonate more. And then that third places video was the one that really like it, it got like, yeah, like around 2 million views on TikTok and then around 4 or 5 million on Twitter. So it was just like everywhere for this week. And I gained like in total close to, I think, 70 or 80,000 followers across different platforms. And like I said earlier, like I'm just some guy. So it's been very humbling to me to like have people messaging me and commenting like that they're interested in what I have to say or what I'm thinking about. So I've been trying to be really careful in creating content to make sure that I'm doing my best to kind of lean on the expertise of others and, and do my best to sort of curate the information that I'm that I'm researching in a responsible way because it is it is very uh, uh, outside of my um, my traditional uh, expertise. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what I love about uh, you know 
folks that, you know, are, are from other arenas, other backgrounds that are diving into urbanism and, you know, starting to talk about this is you talk about it and you present it in a in a different way. You leverage a, a lot of the strengths of your industries that you, you're coming from. And, and like you said, you were uh, you're really known in, in, in the Twitter world in terms of, you know, that, you know, that's that area of 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 really using that platform to you know really just kind of bring attention and 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 kind of blow up a brand why don't you tell a little bit of that story yeah yeah sure so in 2017 um one of the clients that our agency had was the the frozen uh, meat brand steakum uh, if anybody's familiar from like the 1970s and and 80s and they're you know a legacy brand that hadn't really been relevant in a long time, hadn't had a ton of success in recent decades in terms of marketing. So I, through a, a sort of series of odd events, like I was handed control of their Twitter account, which had virtually zero, had a thousand inactive followers um, at the time that I, I jumped on it. And uh, yeah, like there, there was a very little oversight and a whole lot of trust with the um, the client that we were working with. So I was able to really just explore and, and test a lot of different content out. And what ended up resonating the most with people over time were these kind of like uh, weird, self-aware rants about various uh, cultural topics. So like talking about millennial angst with, uh, you know, issues regarding, you know, mental illness and student loan debt and even a lot of the stuff we, we talk about with urbanism, like the sort of atomization um, that people experience today, um, where I would talk about, misinformation and media literacy um, and, and, and another just kind of like really surface level, you know, sociology 101 style um, commentary just to kind of like make not not be polarizing, kind of like to depolarize, especially on Twitter where politics tend to, to be really toxic and the most outrageous or outrage bait style content tends to rise to the top. So I think the fact that it was just like really weird depolarizing um, commentary um, paired with the fact it was coming from a frozen meat brand made it pretty consistently go viral because of the the incentives on Twitter. Like if you're, you know, uh, an account that that posts whatever kind of gimmick, if you see something like that, it's really easy to quote tweet it and be like, I didn't have Steakum talking about politics in my 2022 bingo card or, you know, something like really just kind of goofy or whatever like that. So there was a lot of moments um, along the way that just attracted that kind of broad net. So, so, um, so yeah, it was a really, really strange, strange thing. It led to articles in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, uh, USA Today, and, and yeah, very weird situation that um, I, I guess I'll have to live with for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, speaking of Twitter, uh, so, so this is your, your, your page here, your landing page here on Twitter. And um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> It's almost strange that we're, we're, we're you know, going to have this conversation, but we have to have this conversation uh, just because Twitter is in such flux, uh, you know, over yeah. the past uh, 12 months. I mean, Twitter has been uh, just a, a wonderful platform for me in terms of growing the Active Towns channel and the the identity of Active Towns uh, and, and really bringing people over to the YouTube channel to, you know, check out these interviews and the other profile uh, infrastructure profile videos that I produce. And it was fun to be like really feeling like there was a, 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 a neat bike Twitter, you know, group that in, and an urbanism group that was, you know, you know, seeing and having dialogue and communications and you were part of that because you would you know cross post a lot of your stuff from from tiktok over to here and like you said you know they were going viral here too that's probably where i saw you then and, and connected with you and started following you uh and and so i we have to talk about the elephant in the room is like you know what's what what what's your kind of take on uh, where we're at right now with twitter because I, mean, I just don't know what else to do yeah, sure. I, I'm still very um, up in the air with it. I mean, obviously, since Elon took over, there's been this sort of back and forth ping ponging of hysteria where, you know, he does something, people panic, and the kind of panic kind of just continues to ping pong back and forth. Like, and 
I don't really know if this is the quote unquote end of Twitter, like a lot of people are making it out to be, but I do think he has to step down or something has to dramatically change for it to maintain its uh its its whatever integrity it has left <laughs> at this point because I I I don't see the magic of Twitter, and it's been this way for, you know, Twitter's been around since I think 2007, I believe. And there's really nothing like it um, in terms of, of what it offers people and why it attracts public figures and anonymous uh, users of all stripes. And I think people have been talking for a long time, like competitors like Mastodon, and you've got like, these are all like kind of server or server adjacent um, platforms, and they just don't have the same impact like I, the way i've always described twitter is that it's like one giant house full of rooms that all of their doors open so like if you're in the urbanist room typically like day to day you're just kind of bantering back and forth in this room with your other buddies and then once in a while one of those those things you're talking about will leave the room and kind of like float into the whole house you know right. so like i think the ability for that to happen is both the worst part of twitter and the best part because obviously it leads content to reach people who it otherwise shouldn't reach. And then you, you run into all sorts of unsavory um, interactions and discourse that it, it isn't intended for certain audiences. But at the same time, it's also like how you amplify your reach and how you amplify discussions and how you, you kind of get discourse into what people call the sort of uh, privatized public square nowadays, where you just don't really have that same, um, that same dynamic on really any other platform. So I think... Unless or until another competitor can do that, like can kind of like replicate that and also somehow attract both the culture of Twitter to migrate to it and also the advertisers to migrate to it. Like I just don't I don't see it going anywhere. I just see it kind of slowly deteriorating until the majority of people like you or I kind of just slowly stop using it as much. And maybe we become more active on TikTok or Reddit um, but, but I, I don't think it'll fully go away by any means until, uh, or unless something similar replaces it. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's really been a, a fascinating study in, in sociology and, and, you know, in the technology of just kind of seeing how this thing is, is playing out. And, and, and as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people are, are jumping ship and going elsewhere. Um, I did start a Mastodon, um, you know, a, account and, and whatever, and, and, and I'm cross posting everything over there too. But yeah, to your point, I mean, it's, I loved your analogy too, of a very, very big house with the doors open and, you know, things kind of sneaking out. And that's what I love about it too, is that there's like a lot of, of discussions going on, you know, and you're able to get a little bit of that cross pollination that happens too. Um, and at the same time, I hadn't noticed as uh, toxic an environment as many people, uh, you know, had talked about and, and I don't know why, but maybe it was just, you know, the, the way that I chose to interact. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm kind of missing what it was a few months ago already. So, uh, yeah, but it, what, what I will say too, is that it, I, I, I think intentionally what I'll do be doing for 2023 is doubling down on my content creation on YouTube and really working on that. And, uh, and, and honestly, maybe even on, on TikTok too. And I, that's one of the things I'd love to kind of pick your brain about since, you know, you sort of pulled the trigger and made that happen in a relatively short period of time. What was that like, you know, kind of getting into that rhythm of learning about TikTok? It, uh, clearly you were producing TikToks with, with cats for a while. <laughs> so, uh, and, 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 you know, and it's it, each platform has its own sort there you go. Each platform has its own <laughs> little rhythm and its own little um, uh, dynamic to it, it, it you know, because, you know, clearly Twitter is not like YouTube and, and TikTok is definitely not like YouTube. But what was that like trying to, to learn that and get it going? It was really bizarre because I think in a lot of ways, I, kind of, I approached TikTok in a different way than most people approach it. I probably approached it closer to a YouTuber would in the sense that I, was, I looked at 
the landscape of content creators on the app, and I should say specifically the content creators that talk about walkability, urbanism, placemaking, all, all these these subjects. And the there's a lot of great folks, a lot of talented folks that are are leading discourse on there. But what I noticed was there was there weren't a lot of what I would call, consider I don't want to say high quality, but like there wasn't a lot of scripted content, and there wasn't a lot of evergreen style content. Like a lot of people. Most people treat TikTok the way they treat Twitter, which is that it's sort of these are drops in the river. And, you know, every week is a different week. Every day is a different day. I'm going to post about this one issue that I just saw today in the news or something recently. And then that's going to be it. And the video is going to be gone in, you know, a month. Nobody's going to be scrolling to that video. So who really cares? Right. Whereas like my approach to it was a bit more evergreen or at least attempting to be more evergreen where I wanted to make videos that were less like, you know, you need to see this on uh, December 22nd. Uh, and if you see this two months from now, it's just not going to feel relevant. Like I wanted to kind of pick relatively top level subjects and then, you know, build semi scripts around that, which took definitely more time per video. And there's a lot of times where the algorithm, for whatever reason, because the algorithm is a fickle thing, sometimes it punishes you for like, longer videos or more produced videos. So it can be challenging to kind of figure out that balance. Like, like bringing up the third places video I did, I believe that video is almost maxed out, if not fully maxed out to the time parameters on TikTok. Like I think it's a three minute video and that's, you know, that's my most viral video. So like that's, it's a long video for TikTok, but, but it performed really well. Um, whereas I'll do another three minute or two and a half minute video and the algorithm is just treating it like, oh, this is too long. Like we're not going to give it a bump for people. Um, and that, that's something I discovered, you know, about a month or so into making content. It's really, really bizarre and and uh, temperamental. Like sometimes if you get enough of an initial boost, like from your followers, like interacting with the, the, the post, the, the algorithm will think that it's more viral than it is. And it'll give you some additional, like a snowball effect. But otherwise, it's, it's it can be difficult to predict. So that's that's why I think it incentivizes the the type of content it does where people kind of just grab their phone, go into selfie mode or whatever they're doing, and then just kind of like, you know, run through a really quick stream of consciousness and then hit post with like minimal editing. So my approach was definitely a little bit more time consuming. Like I probably would, I, once I got into the groove, I probably started spending like anywhere from one to three hours writing and editing each script. And then I would spend an additional one to three hours shooting the videos because what I would do is I would, I mean, you, you could see from the, the, what's on the screen, like I would kind of go, walk to certain locations and then walk around filming them, but I wouldn't film it like a one take stream of consciousness. I would kind of go each take as if it's a frame in a video and try to find like interesting or, or at least the most interesting backgrounds I could come across, position myself in them and then do a couple takes so that I had options depending on like how the the different sections would transition with one another. So I really just like, and then obviously you have it, you add on an additional maybe one to three hours of editing that. So like really a lot of these videos ended up taking for anywhere from like eight to 10 or so hours to fully produce. And it's, it's interesting because it definitely paid off in a lot of ways. Like I think this is like a different approach to the, the medium, just generally speaking. Like there's obviously people who, produce pretty high level stuff on TikTok. But again, just speaking more specifically to the the urbanism subculture. And uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a really time consuming approach. And toward I, I stopped making videos or at least as frequently about a month and a half ago because uh, my wife and I just had our first baby. So I've been taking a, a little break recently and I'm trying to kind of consider a, uh, a new approach or at least, you know, altering my approach a bit when I get back into it, because I'm thinking if I'm going to do this level of production, I might start shifting it to YouTube and then using TikTok for a bit more of that quick, um, spontaneous right. style content that it's most known for. Yeah. I, I suspect that that's probably how I'll end up using it if I do uh, dip my toes into it is, uh, you know, to do some, you know, the shorter takes that really point to the, 
the more produced, you know, profile videos over uh, that, you know, live over on YouTube. Um, I think it'd be fun to actually, you know, watch one of these and, and, and give the audience a little bit of a taste, especially if they're, they're not used to, you know, haven't yet sampled it and seen it. So let's, uh, let's queue yeah, up sure. uh, the benefits of walkable communities. So I've been annoying friends and family over my obsession with walkable communities and often get asked why I care so much. I stumbled into the new urbanism movement just over a year ago and spent months reading the research behind it all. In doing so, I found that car dependent suburban sprawl was at the root of so many of our social issues and that walkability can solve for a lot of them. If we reform zoning and parking laws, then incentivize dense mixed use development in downtown districts, the nature is healing meme can become a reality. Our carbon emissions drop, from less car travel and more services done in proximity between people and places. Legalizing multifamily housing makes housing more affordable for everyone and gives people more freedom of movement. Social inequality decreases as low-income earners are able to afford housing and to live without cars, which are the second highest expense many of us have. Accessibility increases for seniors and disabled folks by adding more sidewalk features and having more proximity to services, all with less cars on the road, meaning less congestion for those who still need to drive. Our infrastructure costs go down from building less sprawled out roads and sewage and power lines. Culture becomes more rich when different people live closer to one another, resulting in better restaurants and art and innovation and relationships. Economic prosperity skyrockets from building sustainable mixed use towns. This also means less people feeling lonely or atomized by living so far from one another. Less cars means less traffic deaths and injuries, less noise pollution and less diseases like asthma. The more people who actively walk on a street, the safer that street is, not only from cars, but from crime. Not to mention just the health benefits of walking, which cuts down on rates of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, strokes, and cancer. All this and these goals are attainable by individuals at the local level. If you can get a small group of people, you can develop relationships with public officials and local stakeholders to make these policies happen. Making places more walkable again helps everyone. It's relevant right now with the housing, energy, and climate crises. It has bipartisan and support and you can make a difference so yeah that's why i care about making places more walkable i love it you know and what's so cool is that was like a, a, an action-packed couple minutes of amazing hot takes and and i mean and 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 some of the stuff that i see on twitter are literally like a, a line from that and and like folks there'll be like a whole long twitter you know thread going of diving deeper into just one aspect of that and it was just one after the other after the other and i love like you what you were saying from the editing perspective is every like uh shift in train of thought was a new scene so yeah i could tell yeah, that that took a while to produce <laughs> It's, like, it's our ADHD brains now. It's like, you know, it's it's for better or worse. Probably mostly for worse. Uh, culturally, TikTok and, and platforms like it, you know, it's just kind of creating this really, really short attention span for people, especially young people. So I really, I try to talk as fast as I can without slurring my words, um, try to talk really clear and do as many cuts as I can. Because I know like as soon as you go past the 10 or 15 second mark, you're starting to lose people. It starts to feel luxury or or mundane. So it's like anything to kind of keep the eyes uh, moving and having to to do work to to follow along. So it's a really it's interesting. It's like it's it's kind of sad that we have to kind of think about gaming uh, our attention spans this way. But it's uh, it's just part of how you know demand for for content has has changed. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh, I, I just uh, sort of navigated over to your, your YouTube channel as well. So we do have a YouTube channel there. You're starting to build a little bit of the audience. So that might be something for the future of, like you said, is maybe, you know, especially if you do start diving into some stuff that uh, where you're able to develop that idea and that content a little bit more. I see a lot of parallels between the type of work that you're doing with uh, the type of work that Jason's doing and really diving into a subject and and really doing this edutainment sort of thing it's education and but it's also informative and it's also entertaining and and people like they enjoy it because it's it's quick it's happening but it's also um really helping to dispel a lot of myths and explain things at a a level that hopefully gets out of what i call our 
active transportation and urbanism echo chamber, the bubble that we're in where we're all just talking to each other. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned this earlier, and I think it's an interesting point about how there there's so many new people kind of coming into this space from different corners of the world. And obviously, like I'm coming at it from a marketing angle and something I've found just from kind of going through the different channels, both on YouTube, TikTok and, and other platforms is like there is a lot of I don't want to say jargon, but like it's it's definitely it's a high level subject. And I think obviously not just Spikes has kind of created a gateway in a lot of ways for people to enter in to this this space. And it's accessible because of how well or how, how talented of a, a presenter he is. And he uses a lot of like original footage. He's got a great voice. Um, he does a great job condensing subject matter and also adding a little bit of like a a um, sass to his voice. You can tell like right. this is like hitting him, hitting him at home, like when he talks about like the anger that, uh, that that cars make him feel. So I think like it's a great window for people, but a lot of the content, including a lot of the stuff he talks about, it's like it's a couple steps down the funnel, I would say, in terms of um, like a mass audience, you know, like I think like a person coming into this this area without any prior knowledge about zoning or parking or urbanism or walkability there's a lot of terminology and a lot of like forms of presentation that feel a bit academic ish, I would say. So part of like my thinking coming into this, like and knowing that there's going to be times like I'm not even trying to present myself as, as close to perfect or objective with this. Like I, I still use a lot of this, this, um, this jargon as well, but part of my like thought process has been trying to bridge that gap a little bit because I just, you know, it, it's it's something that I've been passionate about in my personal life, trying to communicate to friends and family. And it's the thing that always kind of is the biggest roadblock with them is that it's just a boring topic. Like it's not, <laughs> right. it's not, heated. you know, you know, like it's, 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 it's gotten somewhat heated at certain specific times when like housing prices or whatever make the news and like everybody's kind of mad about that for a time being, but it's not like, it's not like race issues or gender issues or immigration or guns. Like there's so many topics that just naturally generate like polarization and, and entertainment because people have such strong stances on them and they, they impact so many different intersecting parts of like everyday life. And I think this is one of those areas that should have a similar effect where like you think car deaths and all the issues that car dependency creates around like you know injuries that people experience or um diseases from like emissions or obviously like environmental issues around like the like the the impact of cars like there's so many different things that in theory should allow for like a, a more of like an entertaining subject matter to kind of like rope people in at that top level but once you start talking about like zoning and parking reforms it's like i think people just think like oh man this is like not how i want to you know, invest my my time or my energy. So I think there's got to be new ways for us to communicate this at a very high level or at the very top level, I should say, to to folks. And I think different groups have done a great job of that. I mean, I think the the subreddit F Cars has done a good job at galvanizing people um, who are already maybe on the fence with this. I mean, obviously that type of rhetoric isn't great for you know winning over somebody who loves cars so like like it's not it's not for everybody but there's like different um, smaller groups like that i think that are using the language of politics or culture wars to really try to spread this message and for me like i talked about earlier with the stakem threads a lot of like my approach to politics and culture has kind of come from this depolarizing position where like I want to understand and study conspiracy theories and like what makes us politically separate like in these kind of different realities of information so a lot of my approach has been that more kind of boring moderate I would say but I think um, there, there's different ways to communicate and like how you communicate versus how Jason communicates versus how me or anybody but there's a uh, Alan Fisher I know there's a lot of like heavy-handed transit content on YouTube, and he's, he's a, even more aggressive than Jason. So I think, you know, there's all these different approaches, and I think for me, it's just about figuring out, like, where, like, you, as in anybody listening to this, could fit into that puzzle and, like, kind of communicate to an audience in a way that other people like myself aren't able to do as well. 
Yeah. And uh, I reached out to you um, about a month ago uh, when this, after this uh, particular article came out, Lauren Fisher uh, with uh, Strong Towns uh, did a little profile and what did she do? She profiled both you and Jason. <laughs> and it was a neat, right. uh, a neat opportunity to sort of come full circle uh, for you, I'm sure. It's, you probably had to pinch yourself and say, wait a minute, within a year, I like sort of really dove into this stuff and started producing content. And the next thing I know, I'm being featured in an article along with Jason. Uh, and, and he's relatively new to this too. You know, he and I talked about that. It's like, it's so refreshing for me having been, you know, sort of talking in this space um, as a public health guy, looking at the built environment, uh, but I've been in it for like 15 years now. I've been, you know, in, you know, in my career for over 30 years. And so uh, it, it's, it, I mean, what was that like? Was that a little surreal? <laughs> Super surreal. And I, and I think just a testament to just what we were just talking about. I mean, I think um, there's just there's still so much room in this in this area, this subculture, this space um, for new content creators and for new styles of rhetoric and, and new mediums for for content delivery. And I think, you know, it's it's fascinating because, yeah, like I like I said, there's so many other talented accounts on TikTok. There's this guy. His name's Paul Stout. His uh, his username is Talking Cities on TikTok, and he does work for the the organization Cul de Sac, where like they're kind of they're building that um, yeah. walkable city. I think it's in Arizona from scratch, you know. And super super talented guy, and he's he's uh, temperamentally he's he's a bit more quiet. He kind of has a NPR tone to him, and and that really led to a lot of success on on TikTok. He's got like. Well, I think over 200,000 followers or something like that. So super, super talented guy. And I remember seeing his videos before I started. And I, I realized that he had stopped making them a, a few months prior to when I jumped in. And I was like, man, like he's probably like one of the most talented people on this app and he's not making them anymore. Like there's there's so much room here. Like there's, it's not it's not like a deep pool. It's not like people who talk about gender or race relations or or comparable issues where there's just like a million YouTubers and a million Twitter accounts and a million podcasts all breaking this issue down. Like there is really just so much uh, space, especially I would say um, for for women and and people of color. Like there's this is still you know like like a lot of political issues. Like it's very male dominated. So you like a lot of the YouTube pages and TikTok pages. Like it's a lot of like we were, we were just joking about before before coming on. Like you know two dudes chatting about an issue and like. That is a it's a it's a common um, you know approach that people see, but I think it, if anything, like what I've I've been able to I guess do in the the couple months that I've been making content, like I would hope, even though yeah, I am another dude on the on the platform, there's still so much space for newer people to get involved and to start posting. Like even in the time that I started posting, at least three, if not four or five people that followed me have reached out and been like, hey, I started making videos because of this. And like, I know, like I've heard uh, Jason Slaughter say this about tons of people as well. Like, oh, like we watched your Not Just Bikes series on this. And now I started making my own YouTube videos. And I think that's, to me, that's like the most important and and just cool aspect of all this. Cause it really is like, like the folks like you, like, you know, pretty much everybody in the, in these communities from the, the Strong Towns team to the, the folks at Not Just Bikes to, you know, the, the, the um, Dutch cycling, People like there's there's all these like different kind of uh, subcultures and, and communities within the space. And I think uh, there's a lot of room for new people to join in. So that's been a, a cool aspect of uh, getting to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm going to pop on over here to your your Beacons AI uh, page here and your uh, just a, a scrolling down here and taking a look at uh, all the stuff that you have. And this is a really nice little landing page for people to go to to, to access um, all your other things so that you can just kind of click on through and take a look at this. But as I'm kind of scroll, I'm scrolling through this and then I'm realizing you're a busy <laughs> dude, man. You're producing music. You've got <laughs> all sorts of stuff going on on uh yeah and now you've got a kid too so um yeah I, i'm sure I'm, I'm sure you know trying to make sure that you have life balance and and prioritize you know time for for the family uh you know something's gotta you know kind of shift around a little bit there yeah, yeah you, you, t- you talked about my tiktok transition i think it's, it's really funny because a lot of people <laughs> a lot of people pointed that out over the months being like 
man, I, it's been funny to watch this account go from like a cat account to a, a walkability account. And, yeah. um, and, and that's been, it's funny because I come from a marketing background. And I'm obsessed with branding. Like I love helping both like companies, nonprofits and individuals like just brand themselves in ways that, you know, can hopefully improve their, their approach to whatever it is that they do. And I've always been so bad at branding myself just because like, I, I've just never really cared to, like, I, I I'm aware of it. Like I know <laughs> what you're supposed to do. I just, um, I, like I said, I, I've, I've always kind of been hesitant to really stamp myself like that. And now it's kind of been forced on me because now I've just had these, this viral third places video where I've gotten, like I said, tens of thousands of people now following me and they're expecting a certain kind of content. I've had to really like take a step back and think like, man, I, you know, all the way back from the Stakem stuff to now, I've really made an effort to just not care about that. Like if you were just on my YouTube page for a second and like years ago, I did a podcast. It was all audio. So I used to just kind of like haphazardly upload the episodes to that page because even years before that, I was a songwriter. So that's how, you know, that was all the art, all the content that I produced. So that was where the, all these pages um, mostly originated from was from that background. And now I'm doing this stuff and I'm just kind of like, you know, do I, you know, do I need to start like a new like brand name channel and kind of like start from scratch or or do I just kind of keep doing what I've been doing under my name? Because, yeah, like I think that's uh, it's interesting. I'm not entirely sure as somebody with a day job who has always just done this kind of stuff as hobbyism. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, I'll reach a point where I'm ready to kind of make a break from that and really try to brand myself in such a way that. I can monetize this type of content because I do love it. And it's something I'm like super passionate about. And I'm, I'm really glad that all the kind of pieces have aligned to, to bring me again in, into this space, talking to, to folks like you, but it is, it's certainly strange. And I know you, you, you've done a great job, like branding the active towns um, podcast and like yourself in this space. And, uh, and yeah, it's definitely something I, I think about because I don't want to, I don't know. Like I've, I've seen it happen to a lot of folks where like, it's really easy to kind of lose yourself in your brand, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've always just been somebody who just posts whatever I feel like posting on any channel, not really thinking or caring about being consistent and having an audience and all of that. So now, so now it's a whole, a whole new layer of, uh, of wrestling um, that I've, I've been trying to deal with and, and, and sort out. So I'm sure you'll kind of see that unravel over the next year or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and it, what's what I think is really cool about the content that you're producing out on TikTok is it is your face. It is you, you know, talking to your audience and bringing them along, which really is a, a completely different genre, um, you know, compared to what Jason's doing, where we rarely see his face. I mean, pretty much you right. don't. You just hear his voice and he uh, does a really, really good job on the production side of, you know, pulling together, as you had mentioned, some, you know, original content that he shoots as well as historical stuff and then you know content that others help help him create or help him uh collect and uh so yeah i mean you're in a really interesting situation where yeah you have now branded your name your name is now branded as uh you know this mr walkability this mr third places this mr uh you know hey we need safer streets and and yep. to your point i mean it is interesting because you mentioned it earlier is that these topics, these, uh, you know, safer streets and, you know, car dependence just doesn't kind of resonate the same way that, you know, other hot button issues do. But arguably, they probably should. I mean, when you look at the fact that nearly a yep. jetliner worth of people die every single day on our roadways, you know, somewhere around 110 to 115 people per day, not to mention thousands of, of serious life altering injuries occur on our roadways. But it's sort of a ho-hum thing. We don't, as a society, really even think about it. Should and that's be been like of. the cool. Absolutely. And like, and obviously J Jason, uh, Jason Slaughter calls that taking the orange pill, um, which has been great Brandon, great branding on his part. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think uh, that's, that's a, that's part of the, the kind of fascination and, and challenge of this time period of the, of the movement, because obviously like new urbanism and, and similar uh, areas have been kind of growing for decades, but it's really been in the past couple of years that you've seen this explosion 
of interest on like a national level. Like uh, you got a lot of mainstream uh, media outlets are covering it. You've got these massive Facebook groups and YouTubers and you got Yimbies on Twitter. It's, it's like a whole, there's all these like intersecting um, groups and discourses that are happening, kind of raising the, the general awareness of, of these topics. And I, I've, I know I've personally seen it like I'm among my, my own friends and family where it's like once you see this stuff and you have the language to, to understand it, it's like it radicalizes people and like they can't unsee it at this point. Like I like even my, my coworker made a comment uh, just yesterday about walkability because um, my, my, my one coworker was walking to work and they were, they were just like bantering about like how cool that is. And, and like no, almost nobody can walk to work except for this person. So it's like. It's it's interesting because I think it's just stuff that like, yeah, otherwise it wouldn't be much of a thought, I think, because the, the way the status quo of any issue works, it's like, well, yeah, we just accept that 40,000 plus people die a year in traffic accidents or 2 million are injured a year in traffic accidents. And you have all these cases of asthma and, you know, atomization where people people, especially children and disabled and elderly people can't get around without a car. Like you have all this stuff that's just always like, it's just become the norm for decades. And until you really start to like unravel it and give people the language to understand, like one, it was not always this way. And two, it's within our power to change it again. Um, I think getting that across is it's, it's obviously easier said than done, but once you can kind of open up somebody's eyes to that, it does have the power to become a culture war issue similar to, you know, those other issues we talked about, like race, gender, and, and, and so on. I mean, obviously, it's not, it's not as much of an um, identity-based issue, which, which that, that's an advantage that a lot of political, like even, even issues around like guns, you know, like guns in America are essentially an identity issue. You know, people who, who really identify with being a gun owner or identify, you know, as being like anti-gun. Like, I think it has potential to kind of like ease into some of those spaces, but it's uh it's certainly tough and and there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to consider when you, especially as the national awareness grows we we saw this a little bit with um Trump talking about you know they they're coming for the the suburbs you know is like like this is like an attack on the suburbs so like there's obviously a propensity for for turning like uh zoning into a culture war where you have the ability to activate older, um, typically more white and wealthy property owners who are, are nervous, like they, they're, they're nervous to see their investments go away and their, the demographics around them change. And obviously, like, I don't think the demographics issue is a valid concern, but I do see that the fact that like we've built our, our housing structure in the US and North America at, at large around it being like an investment versus something that like we just provide for people like that is a really tricky topic to navigate because when you talk about you know the the potential for someone's property value to be impacted by like new development whether or not it's real like whether or not it actually happens from new townhouses or duplexes or whatever it's something that people feel at a visceral level like it hits them in their wallet so like it's good it's going to be interesting to see like how these subjects evolve into the national stage in the coming years and how urbanists and people who are again adjacent to urbanists like approach that those topics um rhetorically when it comes to like political messaging and and uh, and content creation yeah and and i have to wonder too i mean does it have to be a hot but button cultural war type of thing i mean is that the only way to like start gaining attention do we have to like create an us versus them dynamic in something because one of the things that, that i try to point out is that strong towns active towns these are these are concepts these are places that across the political spectrum you should want to support because right. it's i mean is it good is it good for the environment yes is it good for uh you know the economy Yes. Is it fiscally right. conservative? Yes. Is, you know, you see what I'm saying is it's like it doesn't yep. need to be an us versus them. And this is, and that's what attracted me to, to this uh, movement in the first place was that it was finally a subject that I could kind of coalesce a lot of my personal interests and, and passions around in terms of like what I want to see in the world when I think of, of political change, because 
yeah, like it's it's one, it's a depolarizing issue that you can rally um, people of all stripes around. Like you have people who can come into it with a libertarian bend, with a socialist bend, with a conservative bend, with a liberal bend, all for their own self-interested reasons. And, and it makes sense cohesively because like the idea of building better, smarter, stronger, more active towns is, uh, is it, it, imp- it helps everybody in all these different ways. So like, I think it's beautiful in that sense. And I, I'm, I'm with you again, rhetorically, I'm of the opinion that it's always worth the fight to kind of try to, to maintain that level of, um, of, of just kind of like big tent movement and trying to be like, as depolarizing as you can and try to be as like, this is for, you know, all Americans or all people, like however you want to frame it, just as, as big as you can frame it. Um, but I, I do think it does, it's the, the kind of crappy reality that, I mean, we're in an era where everything is a culture war and everything is like hyper driven by the, the f- most extreme fringes of a movement. Like even, even when you look at urbanism content on Twitter, not all the time, but a lot of the time, it's the most uh, deranged and angry discourses that rise to the top. You know, it's like it's it's people and wh- whether that's anger is righteous or otherwise, it's just it's it's what gets people riled up. And and I, and I think, you know, even going back to mentioning uh, the YouTuber Alan Fisher, I think that's part of what makes his content appealing. He has kind of this uh angsty socialist vibe to him where it's like you know if he's integrating his frustration at you know capitalism and and all these other issues in a way where you're hearing it like it's coming out in a visceral way through like through language and his tone and i think people really like that stuff like i'm not i i don't think it's the only way but i think like that type of approach tends to rise to the top really in any um subculture or movement so like i i would say like for for folks like you or, or the guy the people at strong towns like or even myself like yeah like i think it's worth to continue to kind of do what we do bring as many people in and, and talk about these issues in obviously not, not an objective way but in, in such a way that really tr- aims to include the interests of as many people as we can and, and raising that awareness to that so that people no matter where they're coming from with their own self-interest, they can feel like they're part of the, of the movement. But I do, I do think as it becomes more and more politicized and, and hits more and more national headlines, we'll constantly brush into that issue where, you know, the, the fringes of the group will kind of uh, un- unfortunately be, be a, a vocal uh, minority that, that uh, maybe attracts some, some rhetorical and, uh, and just just some topics that that aren't necessarily representative of the whole movement necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's when when you look at the um, you know what trends on uh, in social media, oftentimes it's it's you know the things that kind of get people riled up and excited and and whatnot. And I pulled up just a, a tweet here um, from not too very long ago, what a couple <laughs> days ago, or, uh, and and really, um, but at the same time, if we can like try to you know shake somebody into consciousness and and think about stuff and say you know yeah hey childhood independence was destroyed by car dependent you know infrastructure and suburban sprawl and and many people are like what 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 is this guy talking about and so yep. i it's i always try to 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 default towards putting more po- a positive spin on it and profiling the positive things that are happening but i do inherently know that sometimes it's the snarkiness and sometimes the the negativity and sometimes the uh, slap across the face to try to get somebody's attention to say dude look <laughs> seriously this has <is> destroyed <laughs> childhood independence and um and and so I, I i i i struggle to try to find that balance within my own content of trying to um not get too jaded not get too negative uh because i know that blaming and shaming doesn't really ever change hearts and minds um but you know pulling together a creative approach at something like your TikTok videos that, you know, sort of says, you know, gets people going, what, what's this guy? I mean, and it's trending and, and, oh, wait a minute. 
this is kind of cool. And they start kind of, you know, learning about, you know, the topic and the subject. And I think that's, I, I hope that that's the direction that we'll continue to, you know, see, you know, in our respective platforms is people having, you know, that you mentioned the ADHD, having enough attention span to, to, to at least get hooked to the point where they can get curious and then, you know, learn a little bit on it. Yeah. And it's, it's actually ironic and, and funny that you brought up that, that tweet example. Cause it was me, probably most people didn't even catch it, but I was just memeing of like the, the old Ben Shapiro style YouTube videos, or it would be like, uh, Ben Shapiro destroys college student with facts and logic. And <laughs> it's just such a silly, I mean, it used to be like such a viral style of YouTube content and, right. um, it's just it's like a funny meme, but I mean, it is to your point though, I think there's a lot of, um, opportunity to to kind of shift the the, the converse or shift the discourse away from trying to otherize maybe individuals as much and really kind of create a an enemy in the abstract so like and I think that's where like the the whole terminology around car dependence or suburban sprawl have been pretty useful because like right. it, it kind of it kind of leverages the the language of populism where it's like it's us common people against this elite enemy of some type. But instead of it being like, you know, a, 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 a person group, you know, like the Jews right. or, or, or Muslims or whatever it might be, it's actually just like this kind of intangible um, of issue that we can all point to and be like, you know, it's not that we're saying cars are bad. We're saying car dependence or auto dependence or auto oriented development where, you know, everything is centered around cars leads to these other problems. And I think, you know, finding terminology and messaging like that can be um, just, just a really great, great way of reaching people while still using some of that more kind of populist uh, rhetoric, which is powerful. It's un undeniably powerful. And, and, I, and I do think, you know, one of the, the, the advantages, I guess, that this whole area has is that it, we have the facts on our side, you know, it's like, when you talk about all these issues that impact people, it's like it, it is a big tent movement and there is a lot of empirical data to back up, you know, all these areas around health and social issues and economic issues. Like it's really there, there's a whole lot of data um, on our side. So that's made me feel a lot better. Um, I mean, obviously, like, you know, you still got to be careful with confirmation bias and all that, like kind of how you analyze data. But I still feel pretty good about going into making content about this stuff because it's not something that like I went into feeling a certain way. And then it was just like, oh, like I'm just kind of using whatever information is at my disposal to kind of create a narrative. Like it really is uh, dominated by, you know, uh, language or um, studies and research that that really quantifies um, the, the damage that car dependence has done to towns just in all these different areas. So I think that's, you know, a, a great tool that people can leverage. And, and like you said, I think it's really easy across these platforms to, to, to use the otherizing populist language to focus on problems, which is always going to be a strong tool that people use. But to me, and something I've always tried to do as a kind of hook with all the TikToks that I make is to, to really end it with here are the solutions. And like, here's how you can get involved because I'll, for a lot of other political issues, when you talk about, you know, police violence, it's like, okay, we've got pro people protesting nationally, police violence. Okay, well, police policing is largely a localized issue. So like when you protest it at a national level, there's only so much like the federal government or even the state government can do when you're talking about like localized um, police departments. And I think similarly, but on the flip side with this, it's like, you know, it's a way when we talk about walkability and urbanism and building better places, it's really a way to activate people at that local level to be like, OK, just like with policing, like if you really care about building better places, you do have the power and the opportunity to get involved. Um, and, and you can make a pretty big impact by doing or I should say an outsized impact by by um, by doing so versus like national or state level issues where you know, you're talking about healthcare reforms and, and things like that. It's way bigger, you know, than any individual person can really do. But an individual person can go to a city council meeting. They can go 
um, ask their mayor to get lunch with them. They can go and get to know local business leaders and stakeholders to, to talk about these types of issues. And I think um, there's a lot of power in that for people, especially young people who have become politically activated and they're seeing problems in the world and they're they're trying to figure out like what difference they can make. This is like a very tangible way to plug those people in versus the kind of like, oh, I'm just going to like vent on Twitter all day and talk about how the system is bad and not really do anything. But it's very disempowering and uh, and atomizing to feel like, you know, if, if the boogeyman you have is capitalism or consumerism or big tech or big businesses or big pharma, it's like all these things, it's like, you could spend your whole life posting about these issues and never have any direct impact on changing them at all. Like, unless not saying you not saying you physically can, like you could still organize protests and all those things. But I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed at those macro level issues. Whereas when you talk about these issues around building better places, it's like very localized and it plugs people into where they live and, and how this impacts them, their friend, their family, their, their friends and it's just a it's just a really great way, I think, to 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 reengage people with their communities and the facts are on our side. So that's like super cool and, and a very rare, rare uh, uh, thing to have when you talk about uh, like political and, and cultural wars. Yeah. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, some of the things that we uh, can inspire our audiences to actually do is talk to your neighbors, you know, start communicating, <laughs> you know, you mentioned go, you know, reach out to the mayor and the politicians and yes, yes, do those things too, but start off by literally having, you know, dialogue and communications and talking about these types of issues with within your own communities. And, you know, because ultimately when you talk about trying to change how the environment is built and land use codes and all of these types of things, these are big challenging things. You know, actually changing the the design of a street is a big thing, but the way that it really does happen, and, and Chuck talks about this a lot, is it's gotta be a bottom up movement yeah. and you have to start having those conversations with your neighbors and guess what? It's cool that you can also say, oh, by the way, there's this really cool TikTok dude that's got this content that makes it easy to understand. And oh, by the way, you know, there's this Active Towns channel and this uh, Not Just Bikes channel, and they dive deeper into these, you know, th these items and these issues and have these conversations to be able to learn more and more and more. And so in, in one of the things that I really like to emphasize is that we do need to act with a sense of urgency. We, meaning society, we do need to act as, as a sense of at a, with a sense of urgency, especially at that local level. But then we also need to hold our elected officials accountable. And the way that we do that is by a making sure that we're communicating clearly what the issues are and what we as a community are wanting to see change. And then, you know, really getting their commitment, you know, uh, of saying, do you understand that this is an important issue for us? And it is, you know, a very important issue for us because of all the reasons that you just outlined. Um, and bottom line, if, if they are not on board, then we need to, you know, find people to run against them or we need to step up and, and run for office. Uh, and, and basically, you know, that's how we hold, elected officials accountable because ultimately as chuck you know points out you know it's it's that's the body that then pushes that down to you know the directors of transportation and the planning directors and start shaping what our cities and towns and streets look like from a design perspective yeah yeah it's like just shifting that status quo is just so daunting for people and i think you know like you're saying if you can create um like a funnel effect of content to really just like introduce people at a very top, a high, you know, top general level, bring them down into like some of the more technical uh, language to kind of reinforce the arguments that they need to make. Um, and then you get them organized at a local level. I mean, you really, most towns don't have um, like organized, like when you talk about like NIMBYs or like, you know, people who are otherwise, uh, you protesting or, or angsty toward new or different development styles. These tend to just be like individual property owners that are 
typically older, typically retired, wealthier, have a lot more time on their hands. And they're just kind of going to their city council meetings because they don't have much else to do or, or they have um, uh, invested interests like through different property investments and, and so on. So like if you can get just even just starting with a couple, like two, three, four or five people who are invested in the issue to just kind of start to coalesce language around this and to really like not focus on otherizing the NIMBYs at a local level. It's not about like attacking the people who, you know, want to maintain the status quo. Like we're saying, it's really about introducing solutions and potential and like just different styles of development that can really heal our towns that are, you know, <laughs> just having their infrastructure just falling apart and falling in the, and just their downtowns in disrepair. And there's, there's all these very tangible near term solutions to changing those styles, but there's not a lot of willpower within those municipalities. So I think, you know, showing those towns and those those people who work within them that there is a, a thirst for for change can really start what may end up being a five or 10 or 20 year process of redevelopment, but it's something that has to start with a few really dedicated people. Um, and it's, it's been cool to start to see a lot of these like zoning and parking reforms in recent years, especially in some of the larger cities like, a, you know, across California and Oregon, parts of Florida. You know, it's been really cool to see the that hunger and that thirst for, for change to take off with people. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. I love it. I love it. Nathan, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. And thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such a pleasure having you. Yeah, no, thanks so much, John. It was uh, you're a great guy. And I appreciate the work you do. I've been, been watching your interviews the past couple of weeks and uh, super honored that you thought of me. And uh, yeah, hope to, hope to chat soon. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Nathan Allaback. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell and uh, just click all notifications so that you can be alerted to when new content comes out and when we're going live on live streams, which hopefully we're gonna do some more of that. Uh, again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>